So in the last video we discussed for loops and in this video I want to go over something that you can use inside these for loops or while loops and these are called break and continue. This actually saves you the trouble of creating an expression on the top parts of the loop. So for example, as you can see here, we created a while loop, which is always true. It's gonna be true indefinitely. And every time it's true, it's gonna ask us to enter an integer, we'll enter that number. And if that number is equal to zero, we will use this break keyword. And this break keyword just ends this loop and lets us continue to the next line under it. But if we do not enter zero, it's gonna add the sum to the previous integer over and over and over. And if we click play on this program, I'll show you exactly what I mean by that. So as you can see there, it says enter an integer, we'll go 88, we can go 12, 1000, negative 55, and then we can just enter zero and it will break out of this loop, this entire loop here, and it will give us the answer of 1045. And that is the first way to use this break. Now let's go to the second example and let's actually put this to the side a bit. And now for the second example, as you can see here, you might have noticed there are some annotations and these annotations are used to make your code more precise and it can help you break out of certain statements in the for loop or the while loop or whatever loop you're in. It just makes it a bit more precise and you can have a little bit more control over what you're doing. But let me explain what's happening here. So first we annotate the first for loop with the first at annotation and this can be any keyword you want. You can do hello, of course you need to change all of them to make it work and essentially that's all you need to do. Just remember that if you want to assign a name to the for loop you have to write first at and that will assign the name to this for loop and then you can call it later by writing break at first. So what's happening here is we have a for loop for one to four and the first thing that's going to happen is going to print this loop and it's gonna print the statement and then it's gonna to go to the second for loop and it's gonna print this second statement and it's gonna tell you the value of i and x. So it's gonna say i is one and then it's gonna loop this twice. So x is gonna to go to two. And once it's terminated with this, it's gonna check if i is two. And if i is two, it's gonna break the first statement, which is gonna break the entire loop. And this is just to become more specific with what you do. You can also do break at second and that will exit out of this second loop and it will continue the first loop. And it might sound a bit confusing and that is because it is confusing. It's one of the most confusing things I've come across in Kotlin, but just bear with me. I will explain exactly what just happened now. So as you can see, the first loop was executed and then it decided to move on to the second loop where it says the second loop was executed with the value of one because that is the first iteration of the loop. And then it gives you the value of each one. So we counted one, one, and each one of these equal one. And then it, of course, will loop back because this is a for loop, a nested for loop. And the second time it gives you the value of two. So it will say second loop executed with the value of two and X gets this value of two while the value of I still remains as one. And then it exits out of this because it has finished and it checks if this is equal to two, which it is not. So it goes back to the first loop. It says first loop is executed for the second time. And on the second iteration of that loop, it will say second loop is executed for the first time again. But this time it will not loop twice because it will go and check if i is equal to two. It will just cancel out of it immediately, which means we will not get to see the number two on the second loop. And you'll end up with i equals two and x equals one. And it will say first loop ended since i is equal to two, which is this statement here. So this for loop will terminate the first for loop, which will terminate the entire loop. And you'll end up with this mess here. And yeah, I know that was quite confusing. I don't use this very often, but it's good to know in the future in case you want to do something similar to this, you will know how to do it. But let's move on to the second part of this tutorial, which is the continue keyword. So let's copy and insert the other line of code that I've created before this video. So what we have here is a for loop and it has a statement that says print line i and this is always printed. And if i is in the range of two to four with four inclusive, it will say continue, which means we will skip the rest of this and it will go straight to the top of the for loop and it will continue looping it without executing the code below it. And in case it is not in this range, it will print this this will always be printed and it will also print this one here. But let me click on play so I can just show you exactly what I mean. So as you can see on the first loop, it printed the value of i, which was one. It says it's always printed. You get is always printed. And since it was not in this range, it just skipped this check 
and printed the second statement, which is one won't be printed if i in two to four is true. Next, we have all the numbers in the range between two and four, including four. So it will print this statement and it will continue printing only this statement because it will check whether i is in this range. And if it is, it will say continue, which just loops you back to the top of the for loop. So it will print all these statements inside the range without printing the bottom one because we never reach it. And finally, once it gets out of this range, it will once again print this statement at the bottom. That's why you have two fives at the bottom. And finally, in this last example, this is just gonna be an example to make things a bit more clear on how you can use it. It's nothing complicated. Let me just explain what's going on here real quick. So we have a variable of number of type int, and we have also a variable of sum, which we assigned the value of zero to it. And then we wrote for, for i in one to three, we will print enter an integer, which will take an input of an int, and it will assign that input to this number variable. And if the number is less than or equal to zero, it will not add the number to the sum, which means this is a positive number only addition program. And any numbers that are negative or zero will not be added to the total. So you can only add positive integers. So let's click on play so I can just show you what I mean. So let's add 10 and then let's add minus 10 and then let's add 30. And the answer to this should be 40 because it's going to ignore the minus 10 completely. And as you can see, we have 40 there. And let's play it one more time. So if I did minus five, minus three and minus one, we'll have a total of zero because it ignores all of the negative numbers. And you can also assign these annotations to it. Let's say uh, first at four, and then you can say continue at first but I find this far too confusing to use in most programs. It takes so much mental effort just to make sure that you can understand what is happening. So I don't recommend it for now, but maybe in the near future, you can definitely experiment with that, but it should work exactly the same way as when you use the annotations for the break keyword. But other than that, that's actually all I wanted to show you regarding continue and break. If this video was useful, please consider leaving a like. Other than that, uh, I will see you in the next video and yeah.